All right, everybody. So thank you for coming here and joining us this afternoon. You all look so different in person. You have bodies and arms and legs. Uh, so we have one artist in the studio today, which means that it's a BFA show. And we have Katie Snipes with us. So the two semesters for the capstone is Katie's chance to create all this work. And this is the pinnacle of the capstone, the uh, BFA senior exhibition. So without any further ado, Katie Snipes, everybody. My name is Katie Snipes. I'm from Hartsville. I'm a fine arts major here at Coker University, and I'm one of the five seniors graduating this May in the BFA program, like Rainy mentioned. Um, and I'm very excited to present you guys my show today. So thank you for coming out. And now I'll introduce myself as an artist. Uh, as a figurative sculptor and painter, I use clay, wood, plaster, wax, and paint to create explorations of gesture and form. I use these materials specifically for their ability to transform across states of matter. I can heat up wax, solidify clay through firing, and pour plaster to harden it. The nature of these materials is important to the content of my work as I explore themes of change relating to the human body. Now I'll move on to introducing my exhibition. The works in this show explore my anxieties about mortality and my pure wonder for human change. I draw inspiration from re-watching my favorite cartoons, getting lost on YouTube, and being a part of the latest trends within internet culture. I'm heavily influenced by cartoons as a metaphor for human behavior. Cartoon animations are fantasy worlds that we create, and they also serve as an extension of our wor world and culture. I use aspects of Cartoon comedy, such as the exaggerated facial expressions, the way human conflict is treated, and then the fact that cartoons are just built environments to explore the complexities of the human condition. So in order to do this, I articulate my ideas by recycling familiar and nostalgic character dynamics. If you can look around the room, you can maybe see some characters that you've seen before. Anthropomorphism is considered an innate tendency of human psychology and is a subject that I use frequently to study human anxieties, emotions, and conflicts. I use the dichotomy of domesticated behavior, which is externally broadcast, and truly wild, unfiltered behavior that stays within. Through my paintings and sculptures of dogs, I'm responding to Instances where animalistic behaviors are used to narrate human feelings and human dilemmas by exploring snippets of pop culture, such as YouTube videos and other blogger pet content. Mm -hmm. Out of my extreme unease has borne admiration for the human condition. In the end, this body of work has exerted a closeness to mankind that I didn't have before. My hope is that viewers leave with the same fascination with humanity that causes me to make artwork about it. And now, I'd like to pick apart an overarching theme that I just mentioned, anthropomorphism. It's attributing human characteristics to a god, animals, or inanimate objects. As an intentional device, anthropomorphism is what makes storytelling fantastical. For example, Marvel superheroes, Disney characters like Goofy, and then even, have, do you guys remember the Bush's baked bean commercial? <laughs> <laughs> so there's a talking dog in it, right? And the Eminem commercials where the Eminem's talk. Um, but I'm more interested in the fact that this seems to be the quickest route for us to describe our mental states and emotions, and we use it quite naturally, not just within reflective storytelling. And so this is what intrigues me most about humans, and it reminds me that we're still very connected to the animal kingdom. So we humanize animals, and inversely, we 
describe ourselves with animalistic qualities. Mm. So what would happen if a humanized animal was approached by the real thing? This is a scenario that I play out in many of my paintings. So here, that's what I started had started to explore. So while he's being stalked by a coyote, that is a more realistic depiction of a coyote. And right before coyotes and wolves pounce, they get really stiff and still and they're almost frozen in place. And then their heads start to turn ever so slightly. And it looks kind of mechanical. Like I've, if anyone has a pet cat, sometimes when they stalk things, their ears start to turn like little machines. <laughs> right before they zero in on their, play, their prey. So that's what this dog's or canine's gesture is doing. And then Wiley's, Wiley's doing something quite different. He's on two legs like a human. They're kind of flailing about and they're not really planted like his are. And so he's just about to turn on his heel here to get away, but I don't think the outcome looks too good. And this painting is rooted in fantasy. However, there are many examples where this tendency of ours happens in real life. So this is where the YouTube comes in. YouTube and people watching through social media uh, can tell you a lot about human behavior. I really think that half of the internet is probably just funny pet videos. So, for example, my paintings of Scooter the coyote, he's a real coyote. He really has a real YouTube channel that follows his life. Um, find my place. So he's featured in many pieces in the show, but these two portraits here and here are specifically me responding to the relationship dynamic that he has with his caretaker, who's an animal scientist, but um, Many of the videos that are off of him, they kind of, they showcase the same interactions that they have, the caretaker and the, and him. Um, so I, I've never heard of a rescue educational feral animal, but he really does have that job. And so a lot of videos start where the caretaker pans over him to get a glimpse of him and he, every time he'll give like really snarly smiles or growls whether he's in a good mood or a bad mood and a lot of times he comments on like wow he's in a bad mood today or wow he's in a he's pretty tame today but and they do have a close relationship and I think that this Cody has a great life but um the videos really shook me to my core and I had to make some art about it. So that's him. And then this was the one that I painted first. And it was when I was like really com coming off of thinking a lot about those videos. And then I'll move on to my influences. So Jessica Harrison's a contemporary sculptor. Uh, and so I'll talk about some of the figures in the room now. When I was making these little robot figures, so like I said earlier, I'll refer back to familiar characters and sometimes it kind of also leads me to use toys or maybe video game characters as well, not just cartoons. So I've kind of done my own renditions of the Rock'em Sock'em robot toys around the room and some of them are like really closely closely related to the game like the yellow pedestals and then others kind of fall away and become their own thing or a different thing but the way Jessica Harrison sculpts and she has one series it's her bone china figurines and she builds mass the way that I do, but I was, became more aware of it after I'd seen this body of work. She puts them, 
she'll build in the way that little tiny pieces make up the whole thing and then it kind of it's like sticking chew bubble gum together and then all of a sudden you have a big mass so from far away it's really just about the gestures of the figure and then another influence I have is Daniel Richter who's a contemporary painter I can see his influence all around the room um, so the thing that I've taken away from him and it's kind of like imprinted on me is the fact that most of his human figures are never a natural human color they're always um, really oversaturated unnatural hot pink yellow or like ghostly cold blues that are in the people's colors and so both of these artists use different they amplify human gestures and body language through other means and he's the reason why I started tinting the wax that I that sculpt with and also these guys are well it's a representative of the game but same idea um, Franz Messerschmidt is another, the third and final influence I'll talk about, and he is a sculptor from the 1700s, and he's known for his character heads. So he'll sculpt really beautiful stone or clay or marble heads, and their the facial expressions are as animated as they can be without looking totally cartoony. But that's also... It's very similar to the way that illustrators can draw and over-exaggerate facial expressions. And so that um, was a big influence on my sculpting and how I wanted to depict faces that I sculpt. And that's all I have for you guys. It's really nice to hear a round of applause and see all of you guys here in the gallery. If you guys have any questions, please fire them off. Yeah. So going to high school with you, I've seen like the way that you've sculpted and like seeing it change. And so did it change because you had seen that first artist you had talked about, or did it change just like as a process over time through your capstone? Mm -hmm. I don't think my motivations changed. I think because my I could build skill that I could do the things that I was trying to do better. What you're talking about, like really early work that I was doing. Um, yeah, I think that it's just the fact that I could um, starting to sculpt in wax was what helped a lot. I think. And so that was a big change to things that I was trying to make, but yeah, using different materials as well. Did you have a question? Mine's not nearly as complex as hers. I wanted to know um, the um, subject matter of this particular painting on the wall. What's that? What's your inspiration on that? So I've got a few or two landscapes that are, um, one's more based in fantasy and the others kind of came out of real life. My initial plans was to make a fantasy forest that I myself gets lost in and I paint that in there, but then it just became its own thing and I took my own photos on a walk near my house and was painting forests near my house and so it, instead of making this fantasy landscape that I put myself in it just became a space that I'm familiar with and I had plans for it to be a really scary landscape but it turned out to be a nice one that was just 
open space. And the name of it's Hunter Lost. So <coughs> that's the name of it. And I kind of did get lost on my walk when I painted it. So that's the story of it. You weren't talking about the dynamic between like your rock and soft and characters or the people who are like close together. Like these people versus yeah. that? Okay. Um, so I really wanted to use this game as a metaphor for a really straightforward metaphor if there is one that shows a conflict where player one and player two are the same, could be read as the same person. And so there's this idea that you're fighting yourself, or maybe you could read it as that you're whatever the conflict is. But um, so the name of the series is Me Versus Me, and there's five, there's six around the room that are named that. And so at first it was, it was directly, very directly derived from the game itself. And then as I made more, I didn't really need the game to explain that. And all I needed was really the ring. And so they're all, they're, all of these little pairings, they're kind of at different points in their conflict. And sometimes they're talking and laughing and making up, maybe crying, and then Sometimes it's more um, like violent, I guess you would say, over here where they're in the middle of their fight. One's squeezing, the other's kind of like lunging towards the other. And so that was the point behind the variation in figures and good question. Yes. Um. So how do you find yourself switching from painting and sculpture? Like how do you like decipher between doing the painting and then doing sculpture? Because um, many of these sculptures are kind of like similar to your paintings, but. Yeah, so I think with my paintings, I had the chance to be more reflective and I can, Do, I do things differently when I'm working with my hands, and especially if it's the wax or the clay, it has to be kind of an immediately immediate thing that happens. That, like the core gestures in there, I only there's a time limit ticking down when I work this way, and I definitely need to go back and forth because I could spend four weeks or two months on a painting, but these always have to happen in one or two sittings, and so. I definitely need to bounce back and forth between that so that some can just be shut my brain off making things in the moment and then paintings are where I get a chance to reflect. Yes? Um, I just want to go back to, if, if you could talk a little bit about your references for this landscape and some of the others that we've seen you do. Because in your statement you talk about di the digital world and sort of online inspirations, I'm watching you work to build those environments in Photoshop or one of the other things. Mm -hmm. I think it'd be great if you could talk a bit about about how you kind of stitch those landscapes together. And you use Minecraft a bit too. Yeah, I was trying to find. I was using all kinds of tools to make these spaces, and I had many more artworks, but this is the one that made it in the show because um, it was a more finished, complete thought, but yeah, I was trying to build this exact landscape in Minecraft and walk around in it and stuff so that I could maybe like eventually start to treat it like a sculpture where I build the thing that I had painted. Uh, that didn't happen, but it did help me like really make it feel like this was a real place though because I could physically um, visit this in a, my little Minecraft um, saved file that I made. But, um, and then I went back and forth between that, like taking screenshots of that and then collaging the screenshots. So it, it is like using a, a space that's, you can't, it's not really tangible and then 
physically printing it off and being able to mess with it that way. And is that did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. I just okay. think it's so interesting how you get your reference photos to your painting. So yeah. Thanks. You used AI as well, right? Yeah, I did use AI. I was putting a bunch of um like the forest and landscape that Elmer Fudd crossed around in to find rabbits. I took a bunch of those pictures and put them into like the cheapest little AI <laughs> things that I can find online because it obviously it was just to test out things but then it became something cool because it was creating a new thing from like eight photos that I gave it and so I was drawing from those um, that I made. I made those things from the little AI program and then I was drawing from those and so it did help me the that thing that I actually didn't make but the program made it for me. Yeah. Katie, you're um, you didn't touch upon the blocks right here and how they are a part of your pedestal for your um, your wax sculptures. Could All you right. just tell us what, why you chose this as a pedestal? Not this, but as this. <laughs> okay, yeah, I can talk about the wood blocks. Um, I've used these little wood blocks for a while to just sculpt on, and so I'm always around them in the studio, and probably for like two years they've been with me. I've been holding around the box blocks to work on. Um, they're just children's blocks that I've Actually, my dad told me to go pick them up because, like, he's like, I know that she'll use these. Like, she's definitely going to need to use these. And then, obviously, like, a year and a half later, I'm still using them to build on. But I think the blocks start to become important with my sculpture work because of the scale that it references. It's things that can fit in your hand. They were toys at one point, And then... When I look across the room and look at all the different sculptures, they are action figure size. And even if this is a bust and it's a little bit bigger, I think it still references the, the size of like toys and action figures and like the diorama type size. And so that's why I definitely think that displaying some works on the blocks is what they need to be displayed on mostly because throughout their whole creation they've been on the block but um, just for that reason that I get to still reference that size it's like not larger than life but um, or the size of a person if I were to sculpt something the size of my head and put it on a block it'd be different but just the fact that it's tiny and close and you can hold it and examine it like a toy is why I need the blocks. Right. And yeah. well, and they also, I think for the viewer, um, we've talked about this before, but um, you're dealing with some intense subject matter. Mm -hmm. I mean, and you're putting them on children's blocks. So that creates yeah. a conversation that I was curious if that was intentional. You know, I have thought about that before that I'm, I'm using children's toys and but sometimes I'm just making work because of that fear that I talked about in my um introduction right um dying before you have a fulfilled meaningful life so that I do think about birth and then progression of life and then at the very end are you happy with what your life was and so yeah I think about that a lot and I the blocks were unintentional in that way at first and then I, I did find that as well <laughs> I understand yeah so what do you think is next is this body of work complete moving on to something else or keep working on this mm -hmm. I definitely want to work on some more dog portraits but other than that, it's complete. Yeah. All the other stuff is complete, yes. <laughs>
Anybody else? Everyone, Katie Snipes.